In this video, we are going to introduce alternative investments. This is an area of investment management which has grown by huge leaps in recent times, and it is an important section for the exam. It is important here to pay special attention to the unique nature of these investment vehicles. Some communal characteristics are higher historical returns, low correlation with traditional investments, as is a tendency towards lower liquidity. The first thing we're going to look at are how these investments compare to traditional asset classes. Remember from reading 45, the different asset classes which are referred to as traditional and those which we refer to as alternative. Under traditional, we have equities, bonds and cash. Under alternative, we have funds, commodities and real estate. When we compare alternative investments to traditional investments, differences arise in terms of liquidity. Alternatives are generally less liquid. Regulation, alternatives are currently not as strictly regulated as the stock or bond markets, and the activities of the market participants is generally not as transparent. Tax treatment is often more complicated with alternatives. And availability of data, although stock and bond market data is widely available, historical price and volatility information for alternatives is universally less common. Next, we need to look in more detail at the categories of an alternative investment. First, we might consider real estate. Under the banner of real estate as an asset class, we might invest directly or with leverage in land, residential property or commercial property. But the more topical investment in this bracket is securitization. Here I am referring to the various derivative instruments developed over the past 10 years or so to pool mortgage loans into packages of easy to sell, difficult to price bets on the ability of homeowners to pay their mortgage repayments. Next we have funds. Within this class we have hedge funds, which is a term that really refers more to the fee structure charge rather than the investment style, especially since the investment styles employed by hedge funds can be as widely ranging as the universe of all available asset classes. They are an absolute return vehicle, seeking to earn a positive alpha through active management of a portfolio of equity, bonds, derivatives and alternatives in both long and short, often employing significant leverage. After that we have venture capital funds. These mainly focus on seed investment for companies that have yet to make their mark. They seek out growth potential and they invest in the earliest stages. Also in here we might think about private equity funds which generally deal with companies that are not publicly traded. These funds generally seek out underpriced fundamentals and trade to bring a sound company back on track. Moving on then we have commodities. Now when we talk about commodities, we are generally talking about agricultural products, energy products and precious metals. Corn and wheat, oil and gas, gold and silver. Although a direct investment can be made into a physical delivery of these products, Investments are generally done through derivatives. This may come in the form of a linked equity security, an OTC forward, exchange regulated futures contract or an option or a swap depending on the investor and the type of risk they are looking to undertake. Another way you could go is to look at the various ETFs and managed funds which offer exposure to a certain particular type of risk within this area. Next then we have collections. This is a slightly broader class which includes investments like wine, artwork, automobiles, watches, jewellery, stamps. And finally then I have a section marked other. Under this bracket I'm looking for things like intellectual property, patents, other intangible assets. Another point to note here is that alternative investment strategies generally seek to earn a return from active management rather than passive management. This is called alpha. The return from passive management is called beta return. It is common for investors to be aware of the higher returns attributed to alternative investments, but those returns must be considered in the context of a higher risk exposure. Next, we are asked to look at the benefits of alternative investments in the context of portfolio management. There is one particularly major benefit of investing in alternatives as part of an overall portfolio. Now because alternatives have a historical 
low correlation with traditional investments, by adding them to a traditional portfolio, there is potential for significant diversification benefit. This is a major theme throughout this section on alternatives. Now moving away from the general characteristics of alternatives, we are going to calculate and interpret hedge fund fees. Now the most common fee structure in hedge funds is a 2 and 20, meaning 2% management fee and a 20% incentive fee. The management fee of 2% is based on AUM, assets under management, and is paid every single year regardless of performance. The incentive fee is based on profits earned and can be complicated further by either a hurdle rate or a high water mark, or both. A hurdle rate is a performance target, generally a benchmark return, which decides whether or not the manager has earned their incentive fee. If the benchmark is not beaten, the incentive fee is not paid. With a soft hurdle rate, the incentive fee is paid on all profits once the target has been beaten. With a hard hurdle rate, the incentive fee is only paid as a percentage of the profits above the amount of the hurdle rate. With a high watermark, the incentive fee is only paid in years where the fund has grown beyond its last highest value. So if the fund loses money in a given year, the incentive fee will not be paid, and in the next year, if the manager doesn't recoup those losses, then the incentive fee will not be paid again until the size of the fund grows past its high watermark. Let's take an example on calculating these hedge fund fees. Here we have a hedge fund with a 2 and 20 fee structure, a high watermark provision, and a hard hurdle rate of 5%. We are asked to calculate the fees paid to management at the end of each year for four years. The fund starts out with a 250 million and in its first year it makes 25 million and finishes on 275 million. In the second year they fall to 265 and then they bounce back up to 272 before at the end of year 4 when they land on 278. Let's work through this logically. First we can tackle the management fee for each year because this amount is going to be paid regardless of performance. From there, we can check the high watermark and the hurdle rate for each year and if they are satisfied, we'll go ahead and calculate the incentive fees payable for that year. The management fee is calculated as 2% of the starting AUM. In year one, that's going to be 2% of 250 million, which is 5 million. In year two, it's 2% 2 of 275 million, which works out at 5.5. Year 3 is 5.3, and in year 4, it works out to be 5.44. Next, we can check the high watermark provision each year. In the first year, we jump from 250 to 275, so because 275 is the highest AUM figure this hedge fund has ever seen, we're going to pass. In the second year, the AUM has dropped to 265, which means that our 275 high watermark still stands, and incentive fees will not be paid in that year. In the third year, we have a profitable position. We jumped from 265 to 272. Unfortunately, the high watermark still stands at 275, so again, incentive fees will not be paid. In the fourth year, then, our ending AUM stands at 278. Now this is higher than our previous high watermark of 275. So in year four, we're going to pass the high watermark provision. Now we can go ahead and calculate the rate of return for each year. This is done with the basic percentage change formula, ending value minus starting value divided by starting value. In year one, we have 275 minus 250 over 250, which is 10%. We can skip years two and three because they miss the watermark. And this is where a routine saves you time in the exam. In year four, then, we have 278 minus 272 over 272, which is a return of 2.2%. Now, remember that we have a hurdle rate of 5% before we earn incentive fees. This means that although in year one we have passed the mark and will be earning something in incentive fees, in year four, despite beating the watermark, we didn't earn enough in profit to reach the hurdle rate, so again, our incentive fees are halted. The last step then is to actually calculate the 20% incentive fee for year one. 
the only year which an incentive fee was actually paid. Now remember that we have a hard hurdle rate of 5%, which means that we only earn incentive fees for profits earned above the target. First, we need to calculate what excess profit was actually earned. And this is given by the change in AUM, 275 minus 250, minus the management fee of 5 million. Since we have a hard hurdle rate, then we need to take away the hurdle rate, which is calculated as 5% of the starting AUM. So the excess profit then comes to 7.5 million. 20% then of that figure is our incentive fee, which is 1.5 million. Be careful in the exam what you were actually asked for. The total fees charged each year will actually pull some students into the trap of forgetting the last step, adding the management fee to the incentive fee. Finally then in this video we're going to tackle the last LOS of the course, which talks about risk management in alternative investments. Now when it comes to alternative investments, we cannot use standard deviation as a metric for risk. Generally, returns on these assets are not normally distributed and with infrequent transactions, actual returns are smooth, so we lose a clear picture of exactly how much fluctuation there may have been in the value of an asset over time. Given that standard deviation is out, that kills off the idea of using sharp ratio and beta, which are based on standard deviation. From there, we turn to some measures of downside risk, VAR, value at risk, is an estimate of the potential drop in the value of an asset or a portfolio over a given period of time. It measures the likelihood that a certain portion of value might be lost in a particular period. We also have the Sortino ratio, which is an alternative to the Sharpe ratio, which focuses on downside deviation. Outside of the risk metrics we can and can't use, we also need to be aware of the various risks of alternatives, which are not as prevalent when investing in stocks and bonds. Firstly, as we have already mentioned, alternatives are generally less liquid than traditional investments. Although investors will earn a premium for holding this liquidity risk, there is a significant risk that some of your unrealized capital gains return will be eaten away when it comes time to actually sell the position. Another risk we need to be aware of is the potential for change in the correlation between alternatives and traditionals. Although the historical average shows that alternatives should be combined with a traditional portfolio to gain the diversification benefit, the actual correlation between assets tends to rise in times of crisis, which is exactly the time when you would be depending on that diversification. When dealing with alternatives, we may be involved in derivative contracts. Now these in and of themselves bring up an array of risks and complications like margin calls, volatility and speculation, calendar effects, among others. Be sure to check out the sections on derivatives to get a handle on those risks. Another thing we need to be aware of is the nature of regulation in the hedge fund industry, or lack thereof. What an investment manager does behind that closed door may be a complete mystery, and outside of a legal battle, we do not have any control over what roller coaster might be going on back there. 